Hi. This is a little bit different. What I wanted to do today is talk about how I composed a recent piece that I was working on for almost four years, a choral mass. Now, this is not going to be any big revelation for any of you who are familiar with composing, but for those of you who have thought, gee, I wish I could compose music, maybe this will help you get started a little bit and show you how easy it really is when you know a couple of basic things. Um, I always liked a phrase that Stephen Sondheim said once where he was asked how difficult it was to come up with melodies or compose and he said you know it's really easy for him because he loves puzzles and I do too and when you compose you pick a theme a short theme and then the challenge is to take that one thing and just keep recycling it over and over and over again so it doesn't take a lot of ingenuity uh, what it takes is just to find that one theme you like and then find all the different ways you can play with it and change it around to make it a little more interesting as time goes on. So I'm going to show you how I do that. Now I'm using an app called MuseScore and I'll have a link in the description for it. And I've tried all the notation programs pretty much on the market and this was the one I like the most for composing large orchestral pieces like this. I also use NoteFlight for doing little sketches and ideas. Um, now, obviously, you need to know a little bit about notation to write a score like this. So it's not drop dead simple, but there are also a lot of people who have composed pieces who weren't that good at notation or couldn't read music. But this is like uh, a language. You learn to use it um, by doing it. And the more you use it, the better you get. Now, Sondheim talks about a puzzle, and what that is is if I take that um, trumpet line, I can take like the first, say, three or four notes, and then I can try just that alone as a mu musical line, or I could take it and I can flip it upside down, or I can take it and I can do it in reverse. So it's playing around with the notes in that way that gives you a lot of different options. I'm a big fan of bookending, which means I like to start a piece and end a piece in the very same way. I do that in a lot of my pieces. So they start off with a certain theme, and then the theme comes back at the end, and it makes the piece feel like it's all self-contained, that it's a complete piece. So that's my personal preference. So the first piece in the Mass is the Kyrie, uh, which basically means Lord, uh, and it's Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, which is Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. That's it. That's the first piece in a Mass. So I don't have a lot of text to play with, but you have a lot of music that you can wrap around that text and repeat the text in different ways. So when I started this piece, I was just noodling on the keyboard, and I came up with a simple trumpet line here and I'll show you that in a minute. And the trumpet line became the theme for the entire Mass. And that's the piece, like Sondheim said, that I just take and I just repeat in different ways all the way through. And I'm going to show you how I did that. Um, the Kyrie uh, vocal piece that you're going to see here, um, I'm going to explain in a minute, is really just another variation of this. And that became a sort of little sub-theme that I recycle here and there. There are six pieces in a Mass, the Kyrie, the Gloria, um, the Credo, which is my favorite piece. The Credo is interesting because it has the most words of any of the sections of the Mass, but it also has the most just whiplash changes of direction, um, where emotionally it goes from joy to sorrow to joy to sorrow back and forth. So it offers a lot of fun ways to play with the music in doing that. Now, the credo, which means I believe, is then followed by the sanctus, which means holy, and the sanctus is then followed by the benedictus. And the benedictus is usually reserved for soloists. So you'll have the soprano, alto, tenor, and bass um, soloists singing together on that piece. It doesn't always happen, but most composers in the classical era have done it that way. And each 
of those movements, the Sanctus and the Benedictus, have at the end of them a Hosanna. And most composers will take the Hosanna from the Sanctus and just recycle it in the Benedictus. So that's what I did. It made my job easy. The trick was I wrote the Hosanna with the Sanctus in mind going into that. So then I had to shape the Benedictus so that I could get back into the Hosanna without it sounding like a car crash. And then the final piece is the Agnus Dei, uh, Lamb of God, which uh, I'll explain a little bit later. So most of the classical masses uh, that are in the standard repertoire were written anywhere from the 17th century all the way up to the 19th century. And what I wanted to do in this is I wanted to start off with a fairly standard sounding mass from the 18th or 19th century. So it would be something that um, Mozart or Mendelssohn might have written. And so nothing too different or shocking, but I wanted to gradually evolve it so it sounded a little more modern as time went on in the piece. Uh, so you'll see how I sort of ended up doing that as well. So let's dive into the Kyrie and take a look at that. As I mentioned a moment ago, the trumpet line is what I based the entire mass on. So I'll play it for you in a second. And notice the first vocals that come in. Those are based on the first few notes of that trumpet line. And those are going to be repeated throughout the entire piece. Uh, basically every single movement will start off with some variation of that. The Gloria opens with a very similar vocal arrangement as was in the Kyrie. The same ba ba ba, just like in the beginning of the piece. However, this time it's a cappella and it's a lot slower, which gives it a different feeling. Uh, then we move into the first fugue in the piece, a sort of mini fugue that starts to shift into A minor a little bit, and then it pulls itself back into A. And what I'm trying to do there is set up a feeling that things are not going to follow a strict sort of classical model like I set up in the Kyrie, or tried to set up in the Kyrie, where it sounds very old school. This is going to start pulling us into different areas as we move on further through the piece. So that's the first indication we get that things are going to shift tonally a little bit as time goes on. The Credo opens with the exact same trumpet line that opened the Kyrie, only this time it's played on the oboe quite a bit slower, and it's in harmony with the flute above it, and it's almost unrecognizable. That exact same melody is handed off to the altos, who then hand it off to the tenors, and another fugue begins, a very short fugue. Uh, there's also a little quavering line that's introduced that becomes the basis for the invisibilium section, which you'll see I'll mark it with the cursor as we get to it. And that line um, is carried on further and further as the piece goes on. So now we got two little melody lines that are sort of bouncing back and forth in the credo.
Okay, now we're at the end of the credo. And I know some of you are probably screaming out there, you told me I didn't have to know anything about music. What the heck is a fugue? Well, in really simplistic terms, think about um, row, row, row your boat, which is technically a round, but it's a similar concept where in a fugue, you take a simple melodic line and you hand it off between either instruments or vocalists and repeat it and then play around with it. Like I was saying, I play around with that trumpet line. It's the same type of thing. So a fugue is basically like Frere Jacques or um, Row Row or Your Boat, except a little bit more elaborate. So with that disclaimer out of the way, if you look at the top of the score, you'll see that quavering line. And then over on the right, you can see the trumpet line is back again with the oboe and flute. And now the basses are going to pick up that same trumpet line and start a new fugue with it. And that will bring us through the Amen section. For the final movement of the Mass, the Agnus Dei, I once again took just a small section of the trumpet part, the beginning of it, and that becomes the vocal line for the tenor. It's in a different rhythm and a different key, and it's a, a lot slower, so again, it's not very recognizable. And this is the end of the Agnus Dei. And notice once again, we have that trumpet line in the oboe section. This time, though, it's quite a bit slower, and it has a much more forlorn and peaceful quality, which makes sense because we're in the section called Dona Nobis Pacem, which means grant us peace. And you'll notice that the tonal quality of this sounds more like a modern Hollywood soundtrack than a classical piece from the 1800s, and we've sort of gradually moved into the modern era by the end of the piece. So obviously I don't expect you all to go out and write a masterful symphony after that sloppy little demonstration. I was mainly trying to show you how I approached composing that particular piece. Um, 
there's a lot of music theory that obviously I'm going to not even mention because that's not what this is about, but I have links in the description if you want to go to sites uh, for people who really do that kind of thing really well. And some of those sites I've actually used to help me as I did this massive thing. It started, like I said, four years ago. That's when I did the Kyrie and the Gloria. Then I had to put it aside for a while and I finally had time to come back to it and, you know, do some revisions on the first two movements and then continue on and finish the piece. So it's a long process, but it's something I really enjoy. Like I say, it's like a puzzle. To me, instead of doing a, a picture puzzle or something like that, this type of thing I really find enjoyable, especially in the orchestration of it and finding the different tonal qualities to the piece. So I hope you enjoy this little bit, a preview, and hopefully uh, two years from now we'll actually have a live performance of this. This was written for the 45th anniversary concert of the Greater Westfield Choral Association, and uh, hopefully it'll be performed in two years when this whole pandemic blows over. So hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you later.